I just, I'm just yeah. like, I'm just, my energy field is just expanding and I'm just hanging out with that angel and with you. Well, what I can tell you mm -hmm. is it was like a royalty was there. She, she had a tiara on her head and oh, okay. uh, she, the wings were just, I mean, the feathers, I studied every bead on her dress, everything. I got to spend this time and I thought, I'm not worthy of this to be in this presence because of what I did to myself. I thought, why me? And I thought that for the last 30 years or plus. And I, I got to see this incredibly beautiful, most beautiful face. I wish I could draw it or paint it for someone. And mm -hmm. I wish everybody on this planet could experience that. And then I realized. You got to accentuate the positive. You're listening to Karen Swain, teacher of deliberate creation, accentuating the positive, showing you a way to a better life. Accentuating the positive, it's not just bad, it's sanity. Who in their right mind would accentuate anything else? Hello and welcome to another show, Accentuating the Positive with Karen Swain. I'm really excited to introduce you to another gorgeous person, another beautiful being on our world, in our world. Tell you what, I've been meeting so many amazing, beautiful beings lately. Life is miraculous. Let me just tell you a little bit about Robert. His name is Robert Clancy. Welcome to the show, Robert. Well, thank you for having me. It's a true honor and a pleasure to be here. He's a bit of an angel, the angel <laughs> man, this one. But let me just tell you what, what else he does is a creative visionary, best-selling author, spiritual teacher, co-founder of the Spiral Design Studio. That sounds interesting. At the age of 19, Robert had a divine spiritual experience, which we'll go into. And, um, well, what else have we got? Well, basically, a, a, a yeah, gifted, Swami says, technology entrepreneur. So, okay, so rather than reading a bio... <laughs> So he's got that left brain, you know, he's sort of like really technological and logical. And then at the ripe old age of how old were you? 17, 19. 19. Yeah. He has this amazing experience, which he <laughs> keeps a secret for 30 years, which we're going to go into. And he's just released a book, which has hit the best selling on Amazon, which is called Soul Ciphers, which I've read a little bit of it. I haven't read all of it. So excited to talk to you about your journey. Sure. Uh, I'd, I'd love to. Thank you so much. You know, let me just uh, tell you when we connected recently to have a chat and meet each other <laughs> and a Swami, you know, the beautiful orange cowboy. If you have a look at the one of the last couple of interviews I did, you'll see Swami there. Just such a beautiful man. He's like a big fan of Robert's and he's like, oh, you got to talk to Robert. I'm like, oh, all right. All right. So I check out his photo and he's looking kind of corporate. And I'm thinking, <laughs> Okay, kind of looks kind of corporate, not really my vibe. You know, I like the sort of spiritual guru, angel people. And, uh, and then I talk to him and I'm feeling kind of tired and I'm thinking, oh, gee, I must not have slept well. And after we talk, I fell into this deep sleep, this really deep sleep. And I was seeing all this sacred geometry and colors and, and it was amazing. And I woke up about four hours later and I'd had this amazing healing. And, and it was being in your energy. It was being in your presence, Robert. That's what my guide said to me. I didn't know that at the time because I'm just thinking, oh, why am I so tired? So um, hopefully the people that are watching that, this today can feel that beautiful energy presence that you carry with you. Yeah, I recently spoke in Washington, D.C. And I was, um, there was a videographer at the event and I was like, great, I'm going to get an updated speaker reel and everything. I looked at the audience and every single person was crying. And then I looked back and the videographer was doubled over crying as well. So I thought, well, there goes the speaker's reel. <laughs> he can't see the camera now. Um, he hugged me four times after that. And um, yeah, as you said, I've, I've got this whole tech side and I actually got a hundred on a logic exam. I'm one of the few people in the university to do this and got a hundred in the class as well. That's how logical my mind is, and I have this, um, I'm a programmer, so I've got uh, complete logic, but then I had the divine experience, and I'm sort of equal in both halves, if you will. 
Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? Because a lot of people that are very psychic and carry beautiful sort of healing, empathic energy aren't so logical. Maybe they struggle a little bit. Um, I've got a lot of friends like that. And then a lot of people who are very logical and technologically minded kind of struggle to be empathic. And so it's nice to have it's nice to have that amazing balance, that amazing, because both, I would say that both aspects are heightened, you know, like the, as you say, you're really like clever and then you've got this amazing energy that you carry and you're, oh, you make people cry. I love that. Okay. <laughs> so let's start at 19. You had something extraordinary happened to you, which you kept a secret for 30 years. What happened? Yeah, it actually, my journey started um, a lot earlier than that because I okay. do have recollections from as far back as age six, but okay. the big one was at 19. And that's when I, I, I made a conscious decision to go off of my path. Mm -hmm. um, as some people would say, off the rails. I, mm -hmm. I lost many friends to um, suicide and car accidents. And uh, my close friends were away at school. My my parents were having, um, you know, my dad was drinking, he's a, you know, alcoholic and, you know, he went through World War II, he was very, you know, uh, secretive about it. <laughs> and then my mother was having a nervous breakdown at Your the same time. Your dad went through World War II, he must have been, he must be quite old. Uh, me? No, your dad. Oh, yeah, yeah, he, he, he started, um, he went into World War II when he was 17. Wow. He lied about his age and, and got in and went overseas and he was part of the D-Day invasion. <laughs> wow. That's amazing. Yeah, most people, their grandfathers were in exactly. World War II. Exactly. My grandfather was in World War II. That's amazing. Anyway, go on. And, and so, and you yeah. Mom? And so she had a nervous breakdown. Um, just a lot of things were falling apart and it was a very short amount of time. And then my girlfriend broke up with me and that was basically my only friend. And I've been with her for several years and your whole world is that at that age. So. Yeah you know, just like the rug got pulled out from under me and I just didn't care anymore. I didn't care about myself. I didn't want to feel anything. I started mixing prescription drugs and alcohol. There's a lot of reasons why I shouldn't be here today. And um, I was in the restaurant that I worked at and one night a waitress pulled me aside and said, I know what you're doing to yourself and you need to stop. She said, put your hand out. And I put my hand out like this and she put a pamphlet, you know, she went through her purse and it was this little trifold brochure on how to meditate. It had the instructions. And she said, you go home and do this. This has gotten me through some very difficult times. And if you stay doing what you're doing, you're going to end up dead. So I want to see you go and you go do this. Me being the analytical person I am, I, I did go home. I read the pamphlet. I studied everything and I did this meditation for about three hours and well, the short story is I saw a light and initially when I saw it, I saw it through my, I thought through my eyelids and then I shrugged my shoulders like this and went, well, this was a waste of time. And then I couldn't not break the beam of the light. I waved my hand in front of it and I checked my window to see if a light was coming through. There was ambient light in the room. It looked like a laser pointer. And I kept closing my eyes and opening them and I could see it. And I thought, well, this is interesting. And I went back to the pamphlet and didn't talk about this. <laughs> <laughs> and it just unfolded into an angel like a butterfly. And it was made out of pure white light. It was semi-transparent and it looked like a portal, like a dark spot on my wall enlarged. And the being came through like this. And, um, I got to look into her eyes. Um, I went nose to nose with her and you know, I, I was there. I was just in awe. The first thing I said was, Oh my God. Then the second thing I said, so what are we doing here? <laughs> and she didn't, there were no words. And I thought, well, this is pretty odd because she's not talking. Um, but I experimented with it. I kept closing my eyes and opening them. I could see her either way. Uh, it looked like when you have an x-ray, it was like that. And then it was crystal clear. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I'm scientific. So I'm <laughs> trying to figure out what's going on. And I was just filled with so much love and light and healing. And at the end, uh, you know, this, this was there. It was probably about 25 minutes or more, maybe a half hour. She floated forward and touched me in my forehead like this. And I just went into a position like this closed my eyes and I saw 
my whole life, I was receiving all this information and just um, how beautiful love is. And it's the most beautiful thing that we have. And that every act of kindness matters. And I saw this beautiful rainstorm and the the ripples were coming out. And these are all the young people I was going to inspire. I'm going to be on stage and speaking to them. And I thought, you know, at the end of this thing, I went and looked at myself in the mirror and I said, dude, that just happened. And you're going to have to live with knowing. And I wanted to run out my front yard and tell everyone heaven is real and God exists. And I thought they're going to put you in a straitjacket. So I just lived. And I didn't tell my dad until 2012 when my mother passed away. I knew she was going to pass away that night. And that's when I shared it with my family. And well, hang on, I, hang on, because well, you've skipped ahead 30 years. I want to go back. Yeah. I want to go back <laughs> to the angel because, you know, you've taken me there with you in that room and I'm just yeah. basking in that energy. <laughs> I'm just, I just, I'm just yeah. like, I'm just, my energy field is just expanding and I'm just hanging out with that angel and with you. Well, it's, what I can tell you mm-hmm. is it was like a royalty was there. She, she had a tear on her head and oh, okay. uh, she, the wings were just, I mean, the feathers, I studied every bead on her dress, everything. I got to spend this time and I thought, I'm not worthy of this to be in this presence because of what I did to myself. I thought, why me? And I thought that for the last 30 years or plus. And I, I got to see this incredibly beautiful, most beautiful face. I wish I could draw it or paint it for someone. And mm. I wish everybody on this planet could experience that. And then I realized mm. she entrusted me to carry the message forward and it would be at the right time and I would be able to tell people. And I told my dad that night and my mother did pass away at 2.30. And I thought, I can't take this to the grave with me. I have to live my truth. This happened and I know it's real. And I wasn't hallucinating. I was not dreaming and those things. And, you know, I know what reality is and I saw it and I felt it and it's altered me. On um, December 1st, 2012, I woke up different that day is almost as if the rest of the doorway opened. And I could see God's math or the sacred geometry on everything and in everything. Mm -hmm. And I have the words to just come into me. They're like of all the journeys of life, you'll encounter valleys of despair and mountains of hope. Just know that the heavens are above the valleys. The mountaintops touch them. To reach the summit, take one hope-filled step past your fear, doubt, and worry. Love has no walls, thus it cannot be conquered. And love has no boundaries, thus it is always open. And love has no limits. Thus, it has no end. And all hearts come in one size, large. Make sure yours is filled with love and compassion. And when it overflows with that love and compassion, it will accidentally spill over onto others. And I can go on for quite a long time. <laughs> I know you can. <laughs> and uh, it's all, they you, you, just you, flow you through. That, that beautiful <laughs> stuff in your book as well. So, yeah. I, you know what I love about this? I love that you had this heavenly experience whilst while here you know that you didn't have to have an nde to have it you didn't and that even uh even even though you were meditating and we can be transported in our meditation to different realms and it's like you opened your eyes back into this 3d environment like you weren't in a different environment like like right he was here and you were seeing her through your physical eyes this is what i love about this i love talking to people who can um who can translate subtle energy through their physical eyes. Cause it's something I can't do. I can see lights around people, but I haven't yet, not dead yet, seen an angel <laughs> materialize <laughs> unless I didn't know I had, or um, it's interesting that you said, why me? When I spoke to Lorna Byrne, who's the angel lady from Ireland who can see subtle energy, she can see spirit through her physical eyes everywhere all the time. Mm-hmm. She said the same thing. Why me? Why me? And the only answer she ever got was, why not you? (laughs) And I woke up on December 1st with, why ask why when you should ask why not? Exactly. There you go. Same quick, same answer. Why not you? Yeah. And I did, you know, I did research on it to see if there were other historical examples of somebody being touched in the forehead in their mind's eye with the index finger. And I found two. Okay. 
One was in the eighth century and it was the monk who built Mount St. Michel or Michel built um, in France, which is the cathedral dedicated to Archangel Michael. And apparently for him, his story is that Archangel Michael appeared to him a couple of times and then knocked him in the forehead with his index finger because he wasn't listening, <laughs> said, you need to build this cathedral. And then there was a prophet in the third century. And then there's me. And uh, I, you know, happens about every five to 800 years. I don't have anyone I can talk to and say, hey, do you know when that angel appeared and touched you in the forehead with their index finger and they plugged you into heaven and you had all these words and you know your mission and your life and you're going to do all these things? Yeah. Well, <laughs> you, you and Lorna Byrne, like there's not too many people. I've spoken to some incredible people. And it doesn't matter how many amazing adventures they go on, either in their astral body or when they're in near-death experiences. And they're not usually shown their Akashic record or their life path. You know, they're usually shown a snippet, they're given a clue, but then it's left to them to work out. Like it's left mm -hmm. to all of us to, to live the unfoldment of it. Uh, except that Lorna and you, I suspect, are the only two I've spoken to that were given as children um, a real chunk of it. Like she was shown yes. her future and you were shown your future. And, and uh, that's, un yeah, that is unusual. I guess that, you know, they really wanted you on that path. There was no like, let's just wait and see if he works it out. There was like, we're yeah. just going to, we're going to hit him on the head and make sure he knows what's going <laughs> on. Well, it was kind of, yeah, they, they sort of said, hey, you, you know, and I made the conscious choice um, to do that, to go off that path. And when it was done and I, I got back onto my path, um, information came in that, yes, we needed to take you there. And it was not even as bad as it could have been or as bad as most people go through. And it was pretty dark. Oh, um, oh, people go very, you know, into the that. Into those yeah, steps yeah. never come back. Yeah, we exactly. took you there. We put your feet on the ground so you could then help others because yeah. they understand that you're speaking from that place. Exactly, exactly. So many light workers have had horrific, you know, childhood. I mean, I've spoken to like three women in the last couple of days that do not speak to their family because they just had this abusive childhood, and it's yeah. funny because they still carry the wound. I've had an abusive childhood. I had a horrendous childhood. Um, but I see the gift and so I don't carry the wound anymore, but many healers carry the wound with them as if, as if they let go of the wound, then they won't be able to help people. They have to still live that wound, that feeling of right. abandonment, that feeling of rejection, that feeling of abuse. And, um, yeah. Mine is, I just want to lift everybody up to this other level and, I want to wrap my arms around them and, and tell them it's okay. And, you know, even the sun has to shine on dark days. It never not, you know, it doesn't shine. It always has to face the world and no matter what the weather is. And there's always going to be beautiful days after that. And, you know, you'll get through whatever it is and it's all just part of it. And there's always balance and all those things. I see it all and I just want to shake them and go, it's going to be all right. And, and, I, all I can do is, is add them to my prayers. I get messages for people to say, hey, will you pray for me? And I do. Yeah. And I ask the angels. And what I do is I always ask them just to wrap their wings around them so they feel the warmth of that love. And, yeah. and I visualize an angel just wrapping the wings right around someone. Yeah, that's beautiful. So let me ask you, this happened when you were 19, so 30 odd years ago. And... Um, you kept it a secret. Were they communicating with you during that 30 years? Like, and you were just ignoring them and saying, go away? Or what were you doing? <laughs> no, no, I wasn't ignoring it. I was just collecting the information and okay. just guiding. Um, it was like in little spurts, like I'd see things. I, I distinctly remember the first quote I got was love. It's an acronym, leadership, opportunity, volunteerism, enthusiasm. And that's sort of my mantra for this life is to teach people through those actions, how to bring love. So leadership in the corporate world, you need to take people to a place of love. Business is not about business. It's about people. Yeah. Creating opportunity from nothing and having the vision through volunteerism and the enthusiasm is just everything else. It's all the grace and, and the love that comes in. 
And the words were, if you fill your heart with love, life will mend itself. But if you fill your soul with love, you'll be able to mend the hearts of others. And that was the first quote I got in 1994. Okay, say that one again. I can't, I like if that you one. fill your heart with love, life will mend itself. But if you fill your soul with love, you'll be able to mend the hearts of others. Okay, okay. So how do you fill your soul with love? Like, to me, the soul is love. Right. I guess it's just semantics. But, Those are the uh, words, but it, it's, to me it means that if, if you just believe you, you, know, you can heal yourself, but really yeah. the point of life is helping others. Yeah. That's the, yeah. The quote. It's about giving everything you have because your soul is that love and it's always filled with that. And it's an abundance that never runs out. It's the greatest gift we have because you can imagine if you, no matter how much love you give away, you're never going to run out of it. And it's priceless. It's the beautiful gift. It's the greatest diamond. It has all the facets and even flawed diamonds shine in their inherent beauty when they're shown in the light. And that's really the point. We need to see the light that's within us. Yeah. Yeah. So, so feeling your soul would love would be seeing the light in everything, seeing yes. the light in the person you despise, seeing the light in the action you despise, seeing the light Seeing. Yeah, well, you know, I think about it, you know, when you're mired in the shadows of despair, there's always a higher light source behind the darkness, you just need to turn around to see it. And what I see is a person that's, you know, like cloak and they're, they're in this shadow, but the shadow is created by the light. Exactly. You can't have a shadow without light. Mm -hmm. So even when you're stuck in that, you're in the light anyway, you yeah. just don't see it all the time. We never yeah. see the great painting that God has created for us because we're standing on the canvas. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, we're looking at, yeah, exactly. We're standing on the canvas. I like that. So um, something that's come to my attention in the last couple of years, someone said it to me a couple of years ago, and then someone else said it to me again yesterday, which I find kind of sad. But there's this, there's this um, thing that people say that angels like the demons can appear as angels and give you all this love and it's really like not a good energy or they're sucking on your energy or they're feeding on your energy. It's kind of a fear-based thought out there that's turning the angels into the, into the problem, which I find so sad because <laughs> there's so many problems in our world and it's not the angels, it's the people. <laughs> it's like the thoughts right. of the people, not... The angels, and I think that when we start to demonize angels being just, you know, they're just only pure positive energy, they're only liquid love, uh, uh, then we're in trouble. What would you say to that, Robert? Yeah, that's a, a, a difficult thing to answer because it's that what if thinking, and we always have that, and that's part of being human. So, yeah. my, you know, it's the doubt, it's the fear, it's the worry, and I, I've had the luxury and the blessing and the grace to live without that kind of doubt and fear for a good portion of my life. And okay. all I can say is the light that I see and it turned my life around. Yeah. So if it was a demon, it saved me. And yeah. I think I know the difference between the dark energy and the light energy. And yes, there are both. And I believe that, that, you know, there's, there's balance in the universe but light always wins a battle with darkness. doesn't matter. The smallest candle can illuminate a darkened room. And any place that you're in, as long as you bring that light, having that ability to even share the smallest act of kindness with somebody creates that grace. And it's like a single note on a piece of music. That's what we see here. But it becomes this infinite symphony sung by a choir of angels for eternity in all this beautiful love that is there for you now and on the other side, it's, it's accessible now. And that's, yeah. that's the beauty of life. And yeah, it's learning. We need to learn while we're here so that we can appreciate what's on the other side. Mm -hmm. And my mission in my life has always been about love. It's about understanding what that is, how to share it and to embody that which is not an easy task. It's not an easy thing for anyone to be that kind or to do that. And I'm certainly flawed. I don't have, I'm not perfect. I'm human. That's, that's the whole beauty of life. That's what we're here for. 
So when she touched you on the forehead, she took away all your worry and your fear. What happened? Like you said that you have lived the majority of your life without worry and fear. So for those 30 odd years, you never worried too much or were fearful? That's a no, Tell me no, because that. I was, um, a, if, yeah. if you had that, you know, um, encounter and that happened to you, yeah. you know where you're going. Yeah. So I don't fear death. Yeah. I did up until that point. Right. Afterwards, I didn't need to fear death. So I could just enjoy life. And the other part was removing the doubt and the worry. If that happened and came down and I was held, imagine if it was you. Imagine if everybody on this planet had that experience. Yeah. How would that change your life? And that was, you know, the, there were no words ever spoken. Everything was communicated with thought and picture. Yeah. And I was given the name Gabriel. Um, I was told that this is a form that would be pleasing for you to, to see me in. Uh, so she chose a, she, you know, female form, I guess. And it looked like a Greek statue. And I've always had an affinity for Greek and Roman architecture. So she looked like a quintessential Greek or Roman statue of the angels. Yeah. Um, it was all part of it. And just feeling that, that beauty and that warmth. And when I was touching the forehead, I did have a physical uh, experience. My body got warm, the whole, all of me. And I, I just, I believe she healed everything in me. And yeah. I just, uh, I, well, you know, after that experience, I've been smiling ever since. I just, I was like smiling ear to ear. I looked at myself. I had to talk to myself in the mirror because I would be the only person who definitively would know and believe. I had to trust myself. Okay. So you say you didn't have any fear, but you didn't tell anyone for 30 years. So that was a fear. Well, it's, uh, I just didn't want to be judged and by, by anyone. And I did tell a few people along, on, along the trail. Those were people that were very close to death, and I wanted them okay. to know the peace that they were going to be entering into and to not worry or fear their own deaths. And as difficult as that was, you know, to, to help and be there for several friends who, who, you know, passed earlier than me. And, um, yeah, I just didn't want to, I think it was guided. It was more, this will, uh, when it's the right time, you're going to release this to the world and not to worry about it. So I didn't, <laughs> I just lived mm, and I'd walk up to people <laughs> and they'd be going through something. I put my hand on the shoulder and I'm like, you might want to say a prayer they they do go through <laughs> or try to try to give them some peace along the way. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, interestingly enough, I've got another friend who I call him the angel man. He says he's undercover to, you know, he has a business, a very normal business he sees but and it, and he uh, um I was getting he has this car mechanic business, right? And I was getting my car fixed and he's on the phone to me and he goes Oh, you work with the lights. Like he's totally giving me a reading and I'm like, so, but he says he's undercover, but I think that his cover is being blown these days too. And <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, it's, it's how it's going to affect. Yes. My, my business, my family, you know, all of those things it's um, you know, and there's going to be people saying, yeah, he's crazy. He, he was hallucinating. Um, you know, he was on drugs. He was doing this or that. I okay, know that. So let me ask you this. When, how long ago did you, um, you know, come out from the angel closet? <laughs> like, when did you take the undercover off and, you know, announce to the world, hey, I was touched by an angel? Ooh, I love that. Well, the, the beginnings of it started in 2012. Okay. And how's the journey been since then? Have lots of people been ridiculing you and saying you're crazy? No, it's been absolutely beautiful. Exactly. And I've only had people just um get healed by hearing the story by understanding that they're also held that there is this grace and this love and love is such a simple word and it simply means everything and that they're getting all of that from from everything that comes in so 
it has been a beautiful journey. That's when I started posting the quotes and I wrote my story on, on my page and it, and it grew from 111 on December 1st, which I don't think is a coincidence. Um, 111 is an angel number. <laughs> Okay, one, one, I think one, that was a little. They also, you know, I feel that they joke around or they like to have humor in what they do because the, when the words come in, sometimes they're puzzles and then and they get unraveled, or there's there's a humor piece to it. So I always thought, you know, laughter is a unique thing as a human that we have, and it's such a healing gift. You know, when you're going through something so horrible and you laugh, it, it takes it away. And I have an example. You know, my, one of my best friends I've known since second grade passed away in January. Okay. There's another friend that I've known since I was two years old. And with all of us, you know, there's five of us that were all friends together. So we're all there. And obviously our one friend's in a casket. Right. And the other friend is, is a huge um, football fan. So he's wearing his Steelers hat. And I think he had his gloves on too. And my friend who passed away would have said, what the hell is he doing with his Steelers stuff at my funeral? <laughs> so I look over and he is doubled over in grief, crying so hard that his body was shuddering and he was in pain. This and is the I guy with the football stuff on. Yes. Yeah. And I walked over to him and I said, do you realize that if Jeff was standing here right now, he'd say, what the hell are you doing with your Steelers hat on? And he burst out laughing at the same time. And it cured him. It's, uh, you know, the grief went away. And he, he just looked at me and said, you're right. He's standing there like, why? <laughs> and I said, he's still here. That's the point. Yeah. That's so funny that you say that. We were having that discussion in the Inner Sanctum with Natalie Sudman on Saturday. You know, I was sharing a, a story of a friend of mine who I grew up with. I knew as a baby. Her brother died suddenly of a heart attack in his 30s. And they were so close. And she was in so much grief. It was almost like, don't speak to me. I can't speak. You know, she was just in so much grief. Anyway, she's a makeup artist and she um, made him up uh, for the, the, the corpse. And she had a couple of girlfriends with her at the time. And they started putting like lipstick on him and stuff and laughing at, at the bad makeup they were doing and having this laugh. And, and during that, like making up this corpse and having this laugh at how bad they were doing the makeup, it just that pain just melted away for that moment. Yeah. It didn't melt away completely, but for that moment, it melted away. Yeah. And then they were all crying at the funeral and lots of tears and da da da. And so for months afterwards, she was still grieving. And then he came to her, just shining like the sun in her dreams and said, Please yeah. don't be sad. And she wasn't sad after that. Right. And I saw actually my friend a couple of nights ago in my dream. Did you? My, yeah, we were in the Boy Scouts together as kids. We used to be tent mates and, you know, we went through uh, lots of wonderful camping trips. And then I didn't realize, but we found out later, both of us were assistant scoutmasters at the same time. He's down in Philadelphia. I'm up in New York and his son is working toward getting his eagle and and my son was too. Well, the night before my son went in for his Eagle Board of Review, I had the dream that I was there and I, I saw him and I said, oh my God, I've been waiting to talk to you to tell you Sean is going for his Eagle tomorrow oh. and he's going to, you know, and I was thinking of you and he just smiled and said, that really means a lot. And he said, wait a minute, does he have everything done? And I said, yeah. And he says, well, he never checked off his wingman. And I said, what do you mean? He, he's got everything done. He said, no, he needs his wingman at the review. But and he's, he was, the, wing, oh, the, he's wing the wingman. Oh, he's the wingman. And he said, uh, you know, basically he's going to be the wingman at the review. Oh. Did you, you obviously told your son that. And wingman as in. <laughs> as in oh, wingman. I've just got that now. Just the yes. Wingman. You're the wing. wingman, Robert. I tell you, you're yes. the wingman. Thank you, man. <laughs> Uh, it's so interesting because, um, you know, I put the shows into categories at the beginning of the year, which took me forever because I'd just spoken to so many people. And I looked at my angel category and I only had two people. And I'm like, oh, I thought I'd spoken to lots of people who, you know, <laughs> commune with angels. And I'd only really spoken to two. And one of the angels said to me, could you get our message out more, please? You know, could you, <laughs> could you seek out more people that talk to angels? And I'm like, okay then and um i did for a while reached out to a couple of people who were too busy to talk to me and they said no but then you know people started coming to me and you're one of them like the 
the angel <laughs> man, the wingman. <laughs> or yes. the wing man. What else do the angels say to you and how do they uh, help you in your life? Well, it's, um, I can see things with people and I, I guess it's like you trust your gut because I'm constantly analyzing myself and it seems like there's two of me in there. Uh, one of them is, is like my inner voice and the outer. So when I get it, I get, sometimes it's like a little slideshow and I walk past people or if I meet somebody and I get a strong feeling and I'll walk over to them and. I'm starting to get validation for it. And I'll say, yeah, this might sound strange, but you know, I saw that there was a health issue and I know that so-and-so in your family was going through it, but it's really with you. And they, they start crying or something and they say, Oh my God, I haven't told anyone, you know, X, Y, Z happened to me or they were diagnosed with cancer, but they're in remission now. And then there's like a little message that comes in and it would be, well, all I can tell you is stop worrying about that because the worry is worse than what you had, if that makes any sense. And then they start smiling, they hug me and they walk away or I'll see something. And, um, you know, that's basically where I'm at now. And the words come in and, and I'll see them in anything. I'll, I'll look at like a fire extinguisher or something. <laughs> I know it sounds funny. Like how can you inspire, you know, inspire, inspiration from a fire extinguisher? but I do. And somebody read a word off of, it and it was like respiratory and they were challenging me to be inspired. And I said, all right, respiratory. Uh, when the air is filled with love, you'll never have respiratory issues. Just breathe and enjoy life. And then they said, oh, well, pressure, you did that under pressure and pressure is another word on the fire extinguisher, you know, go with that. And I said, all right, when you feel the weight of the world upon, you know, that love will hold up anything as long as your faith does too. And then they're like, oh, my God, you just did that on the fly. And I said, oh, spread your wings with love and life is a smoother sail. <laughs> and I just get, you know, from almost anything, I can see just the way a child smiles or a flower. And I look at the plants and everything on this planet that grows reaches to the light. And there's just words that come from that. And I saw a billboard that said, peace of mind is a beautiful thing, which is a, an amazing quote. And the words will just rearrange for me and, and say, peace of mind may be a beautiful thing, but peace of heart allows you to see the beauty in everything. Mm -hmm. And it brings it to a whole nother level of, and I just feel so blessed that I get to experience and, and read these words and see the math on and just how it all works and, and just the interactions, just the way two people hold hands or everything. I just see the small moments in life are where the biggest things happen. The small moments in life are where the biggest things happen. I know you're full of tweetable moments as Oprah <laughs> would say, but I have to say something about you, Robert, apart from your tweetable moments, all the stuff that flies out of your mouth, it's the energy that you're carrying. And as you were talking about being able to see into people I just got this sense that you're like boots on the ground for the angels. Like the angels are at in their non-physical realm. And as you say, they really don't have a form, but they can appear to us in a form that is appealing to us. And, uh, and I've done that with many of my clients. I said, yes. you know, who do you see? And they'll <laughs> see sort of typical angel type characters. And I'll have a chat to them and say, why are you appearing to her like that? And they'll say, that's what she um, relates to. That's what she's, you know, this form right. is, is, is soothing her mind or um, yeah and that's an important point that mm. that angels are messengers it's up to us to deliver the message they give it to us to deliver we're the only ones that can act upon it we have free will i can get up and walk and jump off a bridge today and 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 my my reign here <laughs> my my time or I can choose to go out and share a smile and reach out to somebody and help them and spread that love or do other things. You know, that's part of it. It's, it's that they deliver the message to us to deliver it in physical form. And when you can write it down or draw a picture or create it or sculpt it or anything, it brings it into more of a solid form here. And that's the key. True, but the message is also an energetic message because I feel it with you, like just being here with you, I feel it. And it's not a solid form. 
and you know you can rattle off all this sort of poetry and, and beautiful things but i it, it's like visceral for me the way i feel you and um i i think i i spoke to lorna just before i went away about a year ago to work in indonesia with habitat and build houses in this treacherous treacherous conditions like um, on the sides of hills with torrential rain that would happen every day. So we're working in mud and we're working with really primitive. And uh, there was about a hundred odd people. How many? A couple hundred? I can't remember now. And I just took, I had was so like filled with the angels that I just took an army of angels with us. And you know what was amazing? Not one person was hurt on this trip. Like a few scratches, a couple of bruises, but there were no injuries. And and that's what we can do as uh, boots on the ground. We can actually right. actively ask them to, um, you know, come on, guys, bring an army of angels with you wherever you go and, like, <laughs> direct them. Go there, do this, do that. Do you find that? Yeah, it's, I can see it, and I just enjoy being with people. And when I see them working together and, and while you were speaking, all I kept seeing was all the symphonies of music that you created with that act of kindness to build a home and a shelter for somebody and just to create a simple um you know act of kindness like that and, and giving of even if you just put two nails in the board while you were there your <laughs> presence to care and that's yeah, that's beautiful. the energy that you're saying it's it comes out from your heart and that's what people feel it's the ripples uh, that, that are created in the universe and the ripples are endless and they touch every shoreline when you create one. Yeah. Well, that reminds me, the last person I spoke to is this beautiful light worker called uh, Stacey Hausch. And she's writing a book called A Thousand Ripple Effects. And she's looking for authors to write a little, like between 500 and 1200 word chapter. Maybe you'd like to, I know you could write thousands and thousands and thousands <laughs> But I probably have already written the chapter because I've downloaded it. So it's probably sitting in my document. Okay. So maybe I could put, put you in touch with Tracy and uh, Stacy, rather Stacy, Stacy, yeah. and you could uh, contribute to her thousand because she's looking for a thousand authors to contribute to her book. And it's, it's for children. It's for children going from adolescence to adulthood, that transition. Beautiful. Actually, that was you at the 19, that, that, you know, that transition because it's when we become teenagers that we start to really rebel and push against everything we've known. And we're in that sort of dark place. Yeah. Like, like you were. And yeah, I see it, you know, when I was at that age and I, I'm mentoring a youth right now, who's, who's going through some difficult time, he'd been arrested and it's part of uh, the program within the city. And I meet with him once a week. And I said to him that I hear your music. And I know you can hear it, but what you're frustrated is because you can't play the music. Mm -hmm. And right now, you, you're, it's almost like you have an attitude piano that's missing some keys. And you have this beautiful music in your head and no one can hear it. But what I want you to know is I can hear that music. I believe in it. And if you think no one can hear it, I can. And it's beautiful. So I want you to create that music. So when you're at that age, and I volunteered for the last um, 29 years with Hugh O'Brien Youth Leadership, uh, mentoring high school sophomores, so these are 16-year-olds, just on a threshold of heading into that, and how to, um, for leadership through community service is what they're taught. And I, I've been in long enough that I've seen them become adults, yeah. and what they're doing out in the world. And that's what the angel showed me with the rainstorm, that I'd be inspiring all these youth. And at the time, I thought... I am a youth. What do you mean I'm going to inspire you? you know, young people? I am a young person. I have nothing to say. And uh, it was just, don't worry about it. It's all going to come. It'll all be there. And I've had the honor of speaking in front of them several times at the closing ceremony in front of 700 people and, and giving them some beautiful message to take back. And, and they, they do remember that. And I do this cheer called the rain cheer. And it's what they all remember every year. So I create the rain while I'm there with, with their hands and, and they're oh, snapping their fingers. And oh, I make this orchestra with all 300, 400 people make rain. <laughs> oh, 
Oh, I have seen that. I've seen that on YouTube somewhere where people are making the sounds of rain with their fingers. That's beautiful. Maybe it was that you. Might have been me. There's a few. There's a few <laughs> videos of me doing might it. Might have been you. Who knew? <laughs> I think it's been out there, but I, I create like an orchestra and you play the people and there's no sound other than the sounds that we make with our bodies to make this rainstorm. Oh. And that's what they remember. But that's the angel showed me the rainstorm and the ripples. So that's it. <laughs> oh, so for, for people watching this who would like to be more in touch with their own angel tribe, what advice have your angels got to say to them? Well, the, the key is to be open, to have an open soul, to be receptive. I hear so many people say, you know, I can't see them. I can't feel them. You know, you've got to, you have to be, you know, when you're broken, that's when the light can come in. You know, the Japanese have something where if something breaks, they fill it in with gold. You know, that's, it's to remind you that that's where the, beauty is in life mm -hmm. and the other part is to to meditate i you know i really am a proponent of that meditation because that will that's like you're you're ringing the doorbell you're knocking on the door <laughs> when you open up or try and you know be receptive to that and and do it in the best way in in light and with all the things that you need to bring forth and the last part is believe in yourself and your self-worth because you are worthy and you are deserving. And each of us have this beautiful message or story or that song that I was talking about. And just because everyone around you can't hear the music, listen to the music within yourself. Mm, that's beautiful. Thank you for that. I hope that lands on the people that are watching this. Um, one, of the, one of the other things I wanted to say about Robert too is, um, you know, when you were touched by the angel, um, you're like, I don't know if you can guess how old he is. I think he's about my age, but um, you didn't really age apart from losing the hair. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you still look like when you say oh, I'm a youth, you still look like so youthful. It reminds me of that uh, movie, The Green Mile, where this healer, Right. <laughs> touches the little mouse, you know, and it never doesn't an age and it doesn't die. It's sort of like that angel imbued you with some magic power. Yeah, and I don't know exactly how I was changed. I can, there has been some physical changes. You know, I've heard in my voice, there's something that's different. Yeah. My um, eyes in some way have been altered in some way that... I look different in photos now than I did. And I do look at myself in the mirror. I go in and I'm going, uh, there's no wrinkles. Like what's going I do one of <laughs> what's going on? And I just turned 52 <laughs> and I feel like I'm 25 and I, I have no physical health issues at all. Nothing. I go to the doctor and they're like, get out of here. <laughs> what are you doing here? <laughs> But do you think that's available to the rest of us? Like, um, I want that. <laughs> I want an angel to touch me and make me, all my wrinkles go away and make me healthy. Do you think that's available to us? Or do we need to believe that to see that? What do you think? You know what it is? I, I have volunteered for 30 years with young people. Yeah. So I, I think that that's, if you want the fountain of youth, that's where I think it came from. Being with this, that energy, because they're the same age every year. I, I, I age. They stay the same that come in. Every year they're 15 or 16. Yes. And every year I get to experience this incredible fireworks display of enthusiasm and love. And also the act of giving. And I know I'm, I'm putting all of my soul into everything that happens there to give them that weekend so that they can have the rest of their life mm -hmm. in that beauty. And I know life is going to have ups and downs, but that's part of it. And I teach them that during this weekend that yeah. you're going to rise above, you know, it's all about perspective. You know, if you're stuck in a hole, you know, you're in the hole, that's your perspective. But when you're standing on the edge of the hole, looking into it, you have a whole different mindset. And when you're at the top of a mountain, looking in the valley where that hole is, it's nothing. So it's all about how you view life and how you view everything around you. 
and having that perspective to rise above, to accept that there is a silver lining in whatever is happening around you. And I've seen it time and time again where something's so horrible or negative and there's something so beautiful that comes out of it. Death is always followed by renewal. And in the Indian or Hindu tradition, it's, it's like that. It's all, you can't have one without the other. It's all part of this rebirth. And that's where amazing things happen in this change. You know, death is not the end. It's the beginning. Mm -hmm. So do you tell your young colleagues about your angel experience? Do you, do you speak about that openly now when you're working with the youth or? Sometimes, you know, if they ask or, uh, you know, it, I'll just say there is, you know, I don't get overtly religious, but I'll say, you know, believe in, in what you do believe in and have something, you know, there, there is more to life than what you can see right now. Yeah. So, you know, reading your book only like last night and this morning, I've had it for like a few weeks, but I only got around to it to yet last night and this morning. Uh, it's a nice combination of story and teaching. I, I really like teaching to be wrapped in a story. And I think that you've got a nice balance of you're on this story and you're talking about what you're doing and what he's saying, what she's saying. So there's this lovely story. And then you kind of go into the teaching and so you make the teaching really obvious so that you can't miss it in the story. And I thought that that was beautiful. So for people that, um, who do you think that the book is for? Is it for people at the beginning of their spiritual journey, people on their spiritual journey? Is it for you? It's really for, for anyone who, yeah, anyone who's in that, but it's, it's written. I, I almost see a word that is in this book is hope. Mm -hmm. And the importance of that hope will never leave your side unless you choose to let go of it. It's always there. It's one of those words that has no synonyms. It's just is. And this book is about self-worth, about healing, about getting past some of the most horrible things that can happen to you. Like, you know, the loss of a child or grief, you know, yeah. of that kind of, you know, like your partner in this life, your, your soulmate and, and feeling like you've lost. They're not lost. You are, you're lost in grief. Yeah. They're found. That's yeah. the, that's the perspective. And yeah, we're only all here for a short time, a blink of an eye. So the book is really for anyone can get something out of this. They can also reaffirm, you know, when, when you volunteered, there's stories about the power of volunteerism, about the black box that we hold inside of us. Some people call it Pandora's box. So we all have this name for it. It's where you put all your dark stuff and you don't want anyone ever to see it. And sometimes you don't even know what's in there. And when you open that to the light, it, it releases it and you can be freed and healed. And it's, it's about those things. It's about finding the joy of life, the joy of living, and the joy of transitioning from this life to the next. Yeah. I want to just reiterate what you said because that was just beautiful. When you're in grief, or when you feel like you've lost something, maybe divorce, lost a husband, maybe you've lost your money, maybe you've lost your home, you feel like you've lost, you're not lost. Uh, sorry, hang on, that's not lost, you are. You're lost right. in the grief and nothing's ever lost because it really isn't. Nothing is ever right. lost. And every relationship's an eternal relationship. You just might have a bit of a break from now to the next time you see them if yeah. you're not looking you know if you're not hanging out in your dreams with them but yeah these words are in the book on on grief and it's an yeah. important thing you know when you know i've experienced a lot of grief recently you know in recent years i lost um well if you say lost that's the typical word um you know people that have passed are my best friend's sister my best friend yeah. uh, my best friend's sister committed suicide best friend passed away from cancer in January. My 19 year old niece passed away suddenly at college, both yeah. of my parents, both of my friend's parents <laughs> and the list goes on. Yeah. And me letting too. Go of grief, yeah. Letting go of grief isn't letting go of your loved one. It's creating more room in your heart for the love that you have for them. And if yeah. you have great grief, then you must have a very big heart too. And it needs to be filled with that love so you can share it with others. And I wrote those words in that chapter that's the opening part of that chapter mm -hmm. because it's really about that. And when 
you understand that part, you know, say, well, I can't talk to them. Sure you can. Well, they don't speak back. You're not listening. Well, I can't see them. Your eyes aren't open. (laughs) It's all of those things. Can't tell you how many times I've said that to people, Robert, and they go, you're crazy or just because you can do it doesn't mean I can do it. And but you can do it and they do leave signs. Yes. Everyone, everyone. And then I've had them come back to me and say, you were right. Yeah. Because the other day I was doing X and then all of a sudden I saw this and there's no way that could have been there. You know, like their favorite object was a turtle and all of a sudden this little turtle object shows up in their house somehow or yeah, exactly. There's, there's those instances where there's a little clue or a little thing that'll put a smile on your face. And my science side, studying all of that stuff, said every element in the universe has always been here, always was here, and always will be here. If we're made from those elements, then we are too, exactly. always here. Exactly. It's interesting. Um, you know, people always argue with me about life after death and, you know, logical minds that say it's just not logical, but exactly what you said. And Einstein said the same thing, that energy cannot be destroyed. Correct. It, can, it only transforms form. So from water to ice to steam, and we are all energy and the soul is energy. The body is energy. It just transforms form. Yeah. So it's and love perfect. is light and it's all part of it. And, it's just everywhere. It can go to the furthest reaches. It'll eventually get there. No matter where the darkness is, the light will find it. Yeah, exactly. So all this stuff is perfectly logical to me. <laughs> That's my logic side. That's my logic side. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's got to be logical. Well, so the book yeah. is really about decoding. So I apply both my logic. So it's decoding a life of hope and happiness because my programming mind and my heart-centered mind both came together in this project and that was what I wanted to do and it was all just beautifully married together (laughs) yeah and what were the other books that you've written because you've written a couple of other books yes I have the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Soul Mm -hmm. um, which is a a collection of similar stories uh, the teachings this is before December 1st 2012 Mm -hmm. and I wasn't ready to write the story of the angel in fact I hadn't told my father about it and then The story in the new book is about the night I told him about the angel. Then the um, second book is Daily Downloads and Fortune Cookies from the Universe, which is 350 plus uh, what I call my downloads, my little messages that I get from seeing everything. So, you know, those are the first, um, I've written over 70,000 words of them. Um, so I have probably enough to make four more or five more books easily <laughs> of just those. Yeah. And then I, I have a third book, uh, Love's Awakening, which is um, part of uh, all these poems that I downloaded. And they're, they're free on my website. So if you get the ebook, you just sign up for my newsletter and you can get the um, ebook of those. And they're great little mantras for meditation. So they cover everything from hope, love, faith, healing peace you name it it's in there <laughs> totally and and when you started putting them out on your facebook page you said you went from 100 to like you've got what how much have you got how many fans have you got on your facebook page uh, it's like, over um, six hundred and forty thousand, somewhere in there now i know it's amazing it's amazing because you said that to me when i spoke to you last and i it didn't really sink in and then i went to your facebook page and i went oh my god <laughs> so so the words are working for you, like boots on the yes. ground. I just, I keep they, they were meant to be shared. So I just started putting them out on, on everything. I just, every time I got one, I would just post it and yeah. I share other pages of inspiration. I can read other inspirational quotes and more words will flow out of those. It's like yeah. flowers bloom out of other words that I read. So, yeah. But we can all do this if we, tune in right Robert we can all tune into that same flow of energy that same flow yes it's there you can't get a surfboard and ride it because it's there (laughs) it's there for everybody yeah yeah so oh beautiful well thank you so much for sharing your light and your love with us well thank you so much um it is you know, I just, I feel your presence and I, I just love this conversation and 
that we just kind of let it unfold. So that's my my favorite type of yeah, that's what I do with all of it. Those yeah, things and, and I just hope and pray that um, somebody out there that this has touched their their heart in some way and through both of us, to, and that that would mean the world to me. I'm sure it does. I wouldn't do it. I wouldn't do this. I wouldn't spend so much time doing this if it didn't. And um, I have to say it always does. People always, you know, write to me, email, and they say that, that everyone I put on this show touches them. And um, it's all about love. I'm, I'm boots on the ground too for the angels <laughs> doing their work. Boots yes. on the ground for my mob. I call them my mob. But uh, thank you so much. Have you got anything coming up that you want to tell people about? Any webinars or? Yeah, I have a workshop I'm going to launch. It's called um, uh, 21 Days to Decoding a Masterful Life. And I, I actually talked about some of the stories. I, I'm also a martial artist, so I relate in some of those teachings and just how all that energy, it's using all of those things in life, you know, to, to basically elevate your presence. And I do have that releasing, uh, it's slated for January and I'm just looking forward to, uh, walking the path. So that's, that's it. You'll find me out there somewhere. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm forever going to think of you as the wingman now. <laughs> <laughs> you said it, the wingman. <laughs> I got the wingman. <laughs> Robert, thank you for being on the thank show again. Thank you so much. Blessings. Yes, namaste. <laughs> so as usual, we kept chatting after I turned the recording off and I pressed the recording again. And this is what Rob and I were saying after, after the show. This is a bit of extra stuff for you. So enjoy. It's really cute said, have you lost weight? And I said, long story, I got this Spider-Man. I had to lose weight to fit in this thing and get in shape because there's no built-in muscles in it. You have to look like Spider-Man. And she said, she was the new director of the children's hospital. And she said, would you come and do this? And I said, yeah, yeah, let me, I'll, I'll, I'll go. And so I, I ended up going there and Spider-Man doesn't have a smile. Like it's, it's a full mask. And just before I walked in one of the wards, the guy came out and he said, can you, can you wait a minute? A child just passed away, oh. a little boy. Yeah. And, um, you know, you can't see Spider-Man cry either. So, yeah. so I went in and this little girl was in a room and we couldn't go in the room because, you know, you had to be gowned and masked because she was so sick. Oh, okay. And she was blowing kisses to me from the door, from her bed. And like, this is Spider-Man. I had to do this and I pointed at her and then I would do the Spider-Man stuff and I was going like that. And then I gave a little postcard that I signed that said Spidey and she took it and it had the nurse read the quote to her and it said, superheroes have one thing in common, all of them. They never, ever, ever give up on hope. She took it, put it on her chest not her head. Oh, that's so, beautiful. so I was led to be a superhero and to understand that. Cause when I was in this little boy came over to me and you know, he said, I know who you are. And I was like, Oh no, don't you know, tell anybody. And he said, you're Peter Parker. <laughs> <laughs> and at that moment I realized, you know, I am, I am that superhero. And they were asking me, you know, like, shouldn't you be out with the other superheroes? And I said, I am. I'm with them right now. Yeah. That's so bizarre that you say that. So I've, um, oh, there's been so much that's happened lately, but I met, I've got a new friend that I met last week and it's not through my spiritual work and it's not a client, it's through investing and, and Bitcoin and all this stuff that, that the universe has given to me, which has been amazing. And <laughs> So she's like my mentor. She's mentoring me in this investment thing, but her son got really sick and she was in hospital and I'm trying to do it and she can't do it because she's in hospital. And anyway, so I spoke to her yesterday and she's in hospital again. She's been in hospital for a week and her son's there. He's got this big tumor on his neck. And mm. so I said, I'll do a healing on him for you. And she said, Oh, that, that'd be so nice. That'd be so nice. So basically as a healing, I just see him in his brilliance. I just, 
I just visualize him in a bubble, just in his most perfect, yes. joyous, happy, beautiful. And the image I got was the superhero. Like I've never had the superhero, but that's what was coming to me. And now you're talking about the superhero. And I was thinking, cause I was basking in the energy of seeing mm -hmm. him and his brilliance. It's and what they need to see mm. to, to, to tap into that energy that every superhero has gone through something traumatic to become who they are. Yeah, totally. And they use their unique gifts for the greater good of humanity. Yeah, totally. And to be that, you know, and I've gone twice now, the, the hospital had me back. They said that that was the biggest event that they ever did. And I thought at the children's hospital, they must do this stuff every day. Wow. And they don't. And I brought so many smiles. He said, from the minute you got out of the car to when you left, I didn't break character, nothing. I, I walked out of the hospital. I went into the lunchroom. I was sitting with people doing selfies and everybody's laughing and they're high-fiving me in the hallway. And this is everybody your loves Spider-Man. Spider -Man. And was it and a I full went mask? Captain America. Huh? Was it a full mask? Yeah, well, I'll show you. Uh, if I if I can make you uh, see, so let's see. tell me again how you got to be Spider Man in the hospital. Somebody asked you if you'd do it. Yes, they because she asked me because I had lost weight and she, and I told her I had the Spider Man and I said it's a movie replica of it. And, oh, you had the um, outfit. Cool. <laughs> so uh, that's a, a friend of mine who owns another martial arts school and he looks like Captain America and he has the um, the actual shield used in the movie. And so this is us at the children's hospital. Oh, great. Look at that. That's so and cool. um, I have another photo. Uh, and I think I've shown you. I don't know if I showed you the. Um, this one here. Sure. One second. Where is it? Oh, there it is. So you call me the wingman. So that photo, mm -hmm. I don't know if you can see behind it. <laughs> What's behind you? There's wings <laughs> in oh, the photo. Oh, that yeah. Appeared. The wingman. Yes. Yes. That was wingman. taken of me before I officiated a wedding. And I didn't know that somebody took the picture. And when they looked at it later, there were white. This was taken in December at 8 p.m., which is dark outside so there's no sunlight coming through the window ah. and they didn't see those when they took the picture <laughs> the they saw it on the film <laughs> on the uh, digital image and you can actually if you zoom in you can see feathers in it. and they were freaked out they're like oh my god i got this picture of you and there's like you know <laughs> oh mm -hmm. i love it oh robert oh so good well, the angels, I love the angels. The angels are so cool. So they're, they're there and it's been such a blessing to meet you. And Swami's the orange cowboy. I'm the purple heart kid. That's, that's how um, he oh, puts he's the on. orange cowboy and you're the purple heart kid. And I know you guys are, um, <laughs> you know, you speak to each other every day and you've become, you've become new friends from the EBC. Yeah. You met each other yes. from the EBC. That's so cool. Yeah. Yeah. And so you had so something that happened to you at age six? Yeah, at age six, uh, my family went on this huge vacation to Jamaica for several, you know, it was like three weeks. And when I got there, I met this man named Alex the Pool Man. And he was about 19 or 20 years old. I was six years old. We were instant friends. It's like we knew each other and we felt that way. It was just like, and he, he said, you know, little, he called me little man. And he said, Are, you know, do you know how to swim? How come you're not going in the water? And I didn't know how to swim. And he, he taught me how to swim. And later, you know, a couple of days later, I fell in the pool at night and I would have drowned. And I knew how to swim. So the next day I told him, I was like, Alex, Alex, I, I learned how to swim and I got out. And he, he was so excited. He said, I'm going to take you down to my secret shell stash. It's like his treasure. It was down the beach. So we walked down the beach and he had this secret thing hidden, but on the way I saw this purple balloon in the water and I went run into the balloon. And the next thing I know, I had the wind knocked out of me. He hit me in the chest, like under my arm and threw me. And he ran into the waves 
and this balloon wrapped around his legs. It was a Portuguese man of war jellyfish <gasps> and it stung him. Oh, wow. And I started crying when he showed me, you know, he said that terrible creature and he went and got a piece of bamboo and stuck it and threw it in the woods and so that it wouldn't get anyone else. And he said, he told me, little man, if that had touched you, you'd be no more. I can't get you to the doctor in time because you're too small for that amount of poison. And then I saw what it did to his legs and I started crying and he said, no, don't worry about it. He showed me all the scars he had on his legs from diving for coral for his village. And he told me about this beautiful village and how he sells coral to the tourists. And I made my parents buy coral from him. And then I begged them to let me go to the village, to let him take me. I wanted him to take me. And I mean, I drove him absolutely crazy until they made arrangements to have him drive me to this village. Yeah. So we pulled up to the village and all day he was smiling ear to ear. He couldn't wait to take me. And he took me to a place and had bamboo cut to make a little drum for me because I wanted a drum. And he took me to like a sawmill where all the Jamaican guys were working his buddies. And he introduced me to everybody. And then, you know, all day long, he was just like, he had sugar cane for me in the car. He was like, just so excited. We went up and all the kids in the village had torn clothes. And it was the first time I saw poverty on this level. And there was this big tree. It was like the tree of life was there. And we pulled up. And that's what he told me. That's, that's our tree of life for the village. And all the kids climbed in the tree and they got avocados and they were throwing them to me. And then they piled fruit up all around me. And I kept telling them, no, no, I'm just like you. You don't have to, don't have to treat me like this, you know? And I looked over and I saw this elderly woman with a trowel making a step for a thatched roof house. So this was a very, it was all dirt and just everything. And all the kids were, were happy. And um, I looked up it? at them. Hmm? What, what country was it again? Jamaica. Jamaica. Mm. Yeah. It was in Montego Bay. It's where he lived. Mm. And I looked up at him and I said, are you people poor people? <laughs> and he smiled and he said, what we are, lack in money we have riches and wealth beyond that with the love that we have in this village and then they brought fruit all the kids brought fruit and put it all around me pineapples bananas and all this stuff and then they made a crown out of uh, palm leaves and put it on my head and then he hoisted me up and put me on a donkey and they walked me through the entire village around every single house through everything like I was a prince and then he took me back. And at the end, I, um, I talked to my parents years later. We were talking about the story because I found the picture of Alex. And I'm like, yeah, and I still have that on my desk. I still have the shells that he gave me at yeah. age six. I still have them. Yeah. And they said, you don't remember, do you? I was like, yeah, I remember almost everything. And they said, you did one other thing that you begged us to do. And you didn't stop. You made us give all of your clothes to the kids in the village before you left. And um, I found out last year from Daniel Brinkley yeah. that the ceremony that they did was when they welcome, you know, it's, it's to um, reenact when Jesus went into Nazareth. It's when the Jamaicans welcome a spiritual person to their village. Oh. Did you ever go back as an adult? No, not yet. Do you know if Alex is still alive? I have a photo of him, and I think the only person on this planet that can find him is Oprah. <laughs> Why Oprah? <laughs> I don't know. I just keep uh, seeing that she's the one that's going to find him or his family or something. <laughs> yeah. I need a private investigator. I only know his first name. I know where he worked in 1971. <laughs> and I know his approximate age. That's so how it. How old would he be today? Uh... Well, if it's 71, I was six. He was probably 20. So he'd be about 15 years older than I am now. So he'd be about 67. That's not too old. 67 or 70, maybe. Yeah. If he's, if he's still alive. Yeah, I got that he wasn't. Well, he's alive. He's just not in form in his physical body. But I might be wrong. I can always be wrong. Anyway. Yeah, but I think it's his family. His, his family uh, is, yeah, for sure. And, his family. Oh, you have them. to go back. That's, that's another book. Oh, no. yeah oh, that's another that's a movie there's the movie yeah. right there well that's yeah. part of this movie is is okay. that and it's all i mean i learned so many things on that i i learned 
like uh, when I went there, I was a minority. So I was learning about, you know, race and prejudice and that there isn't any. And I remember there was like this big storm and this, um, I was by the pool and and there were these African-American family was staying in one of the things and they go, Oh, come here, come here. There's a big storm coming in. So I went in their cottage and the, and the woman had me in her lap. She goes, I've never had a little white boy in my lap. <laughs> and then she kissed me and I gave her a kiss and I said, I never kissed a Jamaican. And she goes, honey, I was black. I'm from Brooklyn. <laughs> <laughs> and it was just, so it's the seventies, you know, so think bell bottoms and they got big sideburns yeah. and afros and everything. And I'm just like hanging from <laughs> this African-American family. And they just took me in and they were so like, he's so cute. Oh my God. <laughs> God. And you have such a vivid memory of it. That's amazing. Oh. I was only six. I had to look back and I was like, oh my God, that was July, 1971. I was just over six years old, like two months. And I felt like I was, you know, eight or 10 years old, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. but I was only six. So I remember like every detail of all these things and just um you know i was shown all these like little pieces as mm-hmm. teaching mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. but that was the weirdest you know when i try to explain to my parents what they did and i remember the kids being so happy and having no toys and nothing and they they were happy so i you learned know, swami pointed me in the direction of lynn twist who i just fell completely in love with like i just think she's amazing and she, one of the first things she says in every, but you know who Lynn Twist is, the soul of money. She, no, I, oh, no. Oh, I have to. But she talks about, she said, uh, you know, I used to, uh, she's worked with um, poverty all over the world. She raises funds for the Hunger Foundation. And she said, I used to call these people poor, but I don't call them poor anymore because they're some of the most courageous, strong incredible brilliant creative people i've ever met in my life and there's no way you can call them poor and she said likewise i used to call the people that i would raise the money from rich but i've met a lot of them and there's nothing rich about their life they might have a lot of wealth but they live very poor lives and she said so i don't define people by poor and rich anymore you know she just totally flips everything She's fantastic. Yeah, I learned, you know, everything. And Alex ended up saving my life in three different ways on that trip, you know, yeah. by first teaching me something that saved my life, then yeah. physically saving my life, and yeah. then giving me the opportunity to save my soul by yeah. giving to the village. Yeah. Yeah. And he was just beyond happy. Like, and it was almost like, here you are again. And then we had to part ways and, and, we, you know, back then there was no way to keep in touch, but it was like, yeah. you know, I'm always going to be with you kind of feeling. Yeah, totally. And he has been. But you Are you ready for this? Yeah. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> That's Miss Lily. <laughs> Hello, Miss Lily. <laughs> is she a puppy or is she just little? Uh, she's about seven or eight months old now. <laughs> Oh, she's so she's cool. young, but she looks tinier and younger than she really is. She she's the runt, oh, and the dogs are small to begin with. But it's a King Charles Cavalier. I love them; they're gorgeous. But she she's is so cute. she's a little viper. She runs around. She just had her operation, so she's what to be to sex back really fast. Hmm? To to sex the operation. Yeah. Because so we can't breed her or anything. That's that was part of the deal. Oh, it was part of the deal. Me. Did they say that you, you're not allowed to breed her? Yeah. Oh, look at her. Hello. Mm-hmm. She's sweet. <laughs> She'll just hang all day like this. Oh, how beautiful was that? Robert. Robert Clancy. The wingman. The angel man. Touched by an angel. Just basking in his presence is beautiful. Oh, apart from what he says, it's just, it's lovely. Beautiful. Anyway, he takes a lot of that um angelic energy into into the corporate world too which is kind of special works with children works with businesses and and um i recorded some of our conversation afterwards which i'll share with you uh but we still kept talking and uh he's got a few things on the boil he wants to make them 
a movie and um, I said to him it'd be great to have a show on own with Oprah you know like talking about the angels and love and all that sort of thing that'd be cool anyway big things happening uh, in the future for Robert and I hope that you were basking in that beautiful angelic energy as well just remember miracles are not only possible they happen every day just keep looking out for them and uh, wrap those angel wings around yourself they're there for you as much as they're there for him we're all boots on the ground doing the angelic work everyone that's watching this so thanks again for watching another show accentuating the positive with karen swain and remember if you want to join our little inner sanctum next year oh i forgot to ask robert but i'll get robert to come into the inner sanctum and you can get to meet him and we can do some angelic healing gosh knows what we're going to up to the angels are in, in charge of that and i've got uh, a few guests quite a few guests lined up for next year for people that i've had on the show this year are going to come into the inner sanctum the inner sanctum are monthly webinars we put on so i we do a meet and greet and people get to ask me questions and they get to talk to my guides blissful beings and talk about deliberate creation how we get deliberate in flowing our energy raising our vibration being who we came to be as well as meeting guests from atp media and um, we get to hang out in their energy and ask them questions too and we have a whole lot of fun we meet each other from all around the world we've got the uk we've got europe we've got australia obviously and lots of people from the states so join us in the inner sanctum for next year and uh i look forward to more surprising miraculous beautiful things happening in 2018 i know it's only november but we're getting towards the end of the year so love you all bye for now Thanks so much for joining us for another enlightened conversation on Accentuate the Positive. If you would like spiritual guidance from my guides, Blissful Beings, go to karenswain.com for a reading or to listen to more enlightened thought leaders share their wisdom. Go to the listen page on karenswain.com and choose who you want to listen to. All the podcasts are also available on iTunes. Remember to check us out on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Pinterest, you name it, we're there. Until next time, bye for now. If you feel like that's what you want